Good afternoon all and welcome to another one of our live streams and this session will be focusing on sorrel production, the CCJ way. I am your presenter, Dennis Lecky, Product Development Agronomist from the Northeast region and let's get into it. So we'll look at a background of soil, you know, what it is. And it is pretty much a family or a relative of the common, you know, that hibiscus plant that a lot of us have in our yard. So it's actually hibiscus. Uh, it's a family member to the hibiscus. Now the common name, you know, that it's called is the Jamaican sorrel, but elsewhere in the world, you might hear them call it Roselle or even a couple other names. Now, the main production areas in Jamaica includes your St. Elizabeth, Clarendon, St. Catherine, Manchester, and St. Thomas. Now, soil is actually a very healthy thing to consume. Uh, you know, some of us even top it up with a little rum, but, you know, the rum won't be as healthy an addition to the soil, but it gives it a nice flavor. Now, amongst the health benefits, is it's high in vitamin C and flavonoids, and it has anti-inflammatory properties. It also aids in digestion, which is, is good. Uh, it's believed to also assist in reducing the, your blood pressure and improve urine flow. So persons who have issues passing urine, you know, your bladder, you might have a urinary tract infection. This would also help with those kinds of issues. It also reduces elevated levels of cholesterol and triglycerides, and thus helps you to actually reduce the risk of heart attack, heart disease, and it helps to avoid your arteries being clogged. So other uses include, you know, it's a popular be beverage um, throughout the Caribbean, especially at Christmas times. But, you know, I would encourage everyone that, you know, soil is really something that we should actually be producing throughout the entire year as it's a very healthy juice and it's actually pretty tasty. So definitely we should try and change it from being uh, once a year or Christmas time uh, beverage to something that is consumed throughout the entire year. Amongst other byproducts used, um, that soil is used to make includes teas, jellies, your jams, chutneys, cakes, wine, etc. Well, there's three main cultivars that are produced in Jamaica. Um, the first two, which would be the traditional Manchester Black, aren't as popular anymore since the bashment kind of gained popularity. But we'll still mention them because you still have people that swear by the Manchester Black, for example, that it has a bit of flavor. Now, the traditional includes, which would be a tall plant, and this one would be the original soil that people know from a long time that takes six months to mature. You know, it's a very tall plant with large fruits. And this was typically preferred by exporters because it had good storage ability and transports well. It doesn't break down quickly. The Manchester Black, on the other hand, is another tall plant with a blackish fruit. This one was preferred by processors because it had very rich flavors. It also was easy to handle and, and used to get that quality sorrel look and flavor from your produce. This one also took about six months to mature. Now the bashment is the newer, more popular cultivar. We call it the three month sorrel. And this one is a shorter plant with dark red fruits and is typically suited for export and processing. And I must also mention, along with the bashment, you know, you have the red soil, you also have what we call the white soil as well. Not as common, but it is also a cultivar that is grown in Jamaica. Now, land preparation for planting soil, because we're going into that period now. So anytime from now, now the, going into the middle of September to the first week of October, 
is when you need to have your sorrow seeds planted in order to be able to be harvesting some sorrow for Christmas. And land preparation is where we'll start. Now your pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicides which can be used in clearing lands could be Glyphos AG41 with Prowl. So you use actually a pre-emergent and a post-emergent herbicide in combination. And this will actually give you a longer control period in terms of your weeds. To get a faster knockdown or faster burn, you would you could use scorcher along with pro. I know the scorcher will give you that quick burn down so that if you need to plant within a couple of days, scorcher will be the go-to product there. Now, apart from that though, soil is a crop that loves full sunlight throughout the growing period. So heavily shaded areas for soil is a big no-no. Full sun for the entire day is not a problem for soil. It will do extremely well on, on in that kind of an area. You also need to plow and refine soils and then bed to ensure you have loose, well aerated soils with good drainage. An important thing to note here is that soil does not like to be in waterlogged conditions. And if it is in waterlogged conditions, some diseases that I'll mention later will be, um, will be affecting you um, if you start to get an increase in rainfall. Now, also an important thing that you can note is that install irrigation where possible, and this will help to increase your production. You know, not a lot, for a lot of farmers out there, the difference in producing um, per hectare 15 and 25,000 kilograms of soil is largely dependent on whether or not you irrigate. Because if you go into a dry period during the growing cycle, you know, you will have a reduction in your overall production. And why we produce soil is because we want to have the soil flowers to sell, to make some money. And the more you have, the more pounds you have, the more money you eventually make. Now, there are two major ways of planting soils. Sorry, seeds, I should say. And one is direct planting. And what we advise the farmers is that soak seeds because they tend to go dormant. You know, soil seeds, you can store them for years in the right conditions. I have had interactions with farmers who have stored their seeds for five whole years in buckets. And they have had no problems with germination once they soak them in order to break dormancy. Now, our little trick to get you that better performance is to sow the seeds in solid row, which we also call kickstart, for about an hour, and that will help to break dormancy. And then depending on the cultivar, you know, your plant spacing may vary from 60 centimeters to 120 centimeters, or basically two by four feet, or 90 centimeters by 120 centimeters, which would also be like about three by four feet. And, you know, so this is if you use, if you're planting like the traditional variety or the Manchester black, you might use the wider spacing because, you know, those are bigger, taller plants and need more space versus the bashment, which would need a, a, a could use a tighter planting density. Now, if direct seeding is taking place, ensure that you plant the seeds at a depth of about three centimeters or one and a quarter inches deep and lightly cover with soil. Um, we recommend also because you know you might have ants or mice and you plant hundreds, thousands of soil seeds, but over the course of uh, a week or two, you notice less than half or a quarter of them actually germinating. Ants and mice love feeding on soil seeds and they may come and take, dig them out. So diazinan or cabaril can be used to treat the seed holes, then mix out those chemicals in water, and just do a little drench on the seed holes after planting, and that will help keep away your mice and your ants, and ensure that you don't lose any of your seeds. Now, germination should occur within five to seven days after planting, providing that you know, keep the soil moist, 
and the conditions are right, you should see germination within five to seven days. Now, if you choose to tree and transplant, which a number of persons are now looking to do, uh, because you know usually the traditional thing would have been to put two or three or four seeds per hole in your direct planting. No farmers are actually looking at treeing and transplanting to ensure that every seed goes the maximum distance because seeds are expensive, it comes at a cost to you, and you don't want to lose or waste even one. So if you tree and transplant, once again you would soak seeds in a solid grow kickstart solution for about one hour to break dormancy. Use preferably the 128 or 200 cell trays. Um, smaller cell size or, or, or smaller cell trays than the 200 cell trays. Maybe too small, you don't get that root development, you know, that big healthy root ball that you might want from your soil. Germination, once again, should occur within five to seven days. And then you are able to grow them up for about another week or two and then transplant. Once again, you would also plant with the similar planting distances. The only difference now is that you transplant seedlings to a depth of about six centimeters in the late afternoon and water them right after. We also recommend on transplanting into the field, use diazinon in combination with plant guard to treat seedlings to reduce the damage or the potential damage from crickets, slugs, or snails because they tend to come out in the late evening or night and feed on the seedlings, the fresh transplanted seedlings that soft and nice and taste good. Now, after transplanting, start you introduce now your fertilizer program. Now, after your seedlings have taken root, so just about a week after transplanting, you may use Abodom 11-22-22 plus sulfate of ammonia at a ratio of three to one, and that would give you just about 400 kilograms per hectare. If it's an acre, it's just about 200 pounds of fertilizer per acre. So in, <clears throat> sorry, once doing this application now, you also want to ensure that you cover the fertilizer and don't put the fertilizer too close to the ceiling because potentially you might burn the seedlings, whether it be the stem or the roots of the seed. Daily scouting of your field is recommended, and this is to ensure that you observe for any pest or disease issues, because those can come in and sometimes one day not going to your field and taking a look at it can mean a difference between production and a loss in your production due to pest or disease. And it tends to be much more expensive to treat pest and disease issues than to prevent. Now, weed control is also advised in order to ensure that the yield is not reduced due to weed competition. And this is a key thing with soil because in a lot of cases, especially when it is done by direct seeding, especially, a lot of times the weeds tend to grow up and out of the soil faster than the soil. And then you have to be manually weeding and using herbicides to go through the field. So hence why we recommend a pre-emergent herbicide such as Pro to help keep the weeds under control. A weekly spray cycle is advised and you know, CCJ, we produce and have a number of spray programs that can be used and we encourage farmers to ensure, you know, don't take the risk of losing your crop by not spraying on it with a weekly cycle. It's better to prevent than to try and cure any problems. Now, after transplanting also, the use of biostimulants and foliar fertilizers, such as your cytokine, Nutrient Express, Bio20, and Calmax B can be used to increase your overall yield. So remember our cytokine, which is a plant growth regulator and a yield enhancer combined with like a Nutrient Express, which gives you your blossom boosting and your plant starting it gives you a bigger, healthier plant that comes into production much faster. And what we want, 
early production of soil so it can start to hit the market early. You know, you have a lot of people that like to buy and stock up the soil in their freezer uh, before Christmas and don't want to wait until last minute because the family coming in and you might not be able to get soil. All of those things encourage people to try and get their soil early. So from the first week of December, you want to have soil out there on the market selling. And, you know, the good thing with soil, especially like the bashment cultivar, you can be harvesting it for four, five, six weeks from the, that first day of harvesting, which is excellent. Bio 20 and Calmax B, you know, with Bio 20, especially in the seedlings that were transplanted out as a drench or foliar application, gives you that good root development early on, ensures that you have a very strong and vigorous plant. Calmax B ensures you don't have any flower bud drops. You, do, you have excellent, strong, firm, Flowers, you know, the, the, the calyx is sperm, it don't break down easy, so it stores well. All of that is other key thing that you want to have when using your Calmax B. Now, flowering should begin at approximately eight weeks old, and you know, you're harvesting in about 10 to 12 weeks old, and this is more specifically for the Bushman variety, which is the more common variety planted here in Jamaica. And this would continue for a period of four to six weeks after. It's advised that you that you, you harvest in the afternoons and the fruit or the calyx, which is what we take and boil, is stored in a cool, dry place. Use onion bags to store and transport harvested soil. A lot of persons use um, crates, especially those or boxes that don't have good aeration and that can cause premature breakdown in your soil. After removing the seeds, and typically how we remove the seeds is with an old umbrella, the bone from an old umbrella, you use it and pluck the soil. You store them in a cool, dry place, and you can actually save back the seeds for replanting. And as I said earlier, these seeds, if stored properly, they can be there and be viable for years after harvesting took place. Now pests and diseases of soil. There are three major pests that affect soil and this would be thrips, armyworms and root knot nematode. Amongst the diseases of soil now you have your leaf spot, phytoptora and powdery mildew. Now weed control is also key to ensuring high production and what we recommend that you can use relatively safely through your field is Carista GA uh, as a means of weed control. And for Carista GA, especially if it is that it catches your plant, you know, as long as you don't completely bathe the plant with Carista, it will actually kill the weeds and not have any significant damage on your soil plant. Uh, your treatments, once again, should be applied as a prevention and used to keep populations at a minimum. Because one other thing you have to note is that you can't get 100% control of any of the problems that might occur, but you want to keep it at what we say is below economic threshold where it don't affect what you earn significantly. All right? Now, the pests, thrips. Now, thrips are really, really difficult pests to control. And this is because they are very small and they reproduce rapidly and leads to high infestations quite quickly. They feed on fruits and reduce the export potential of your soil. It also consists, uh, they, they also consist of five developmental stages. And you know, typically, uh, it takes about 19 days for them to mature from eggs to adults. So it's a pretty fast turnaround time in terms of their reproductive cycle. And as such, you can run, end up with a huge infestation rather quickly. And then the females actually lay between two to 10 eggs per day. So imagine that, you know, if you have a hundred females laying 10 eggs per day, you're running into some serious, serious trouble within a 20-day period by the time the next set or the next generation would have matured. 
But luckily, we have some excellent treatments which provide pretty good control of trips in soil. And these include caprid, which can be used at 5 mils per 3.8 liters, and diazinon, which can be used at 15 mils per 3.8 liters. Next up is armyworms. And typically, armyworms have a fourth stage life cycle. And you know, the females, they tend to come out and mate at night. And it can lay up to 1,000 eggs in one sitting in some masses on leaves. And they tend to lay high up on the underside of leaves. The larvae hatch and begin feeding immediately. And the growth from larvae to adults typically takes about two to three weeks, during which time they'll be feeding pretty much constant. After they reach you know, maximum size as a larvae, so if you notice in this life cycle, you see the adult moth, you see the eggs, then the larvae, then the pupa. Once they reach that maximum size larvae, they fall from the plant and burrow into the soil and form a pupa. And then in about two weeks, they emerge as adults and restart the whole cycle. Now, our treatments include, and for armyworms, it's relatively easy to control them once you have the correct mix of products. We have our worm control strategy, and it includes products such as Caratrax, used at 5 mil per 3.8 liters, followed by Mimic at 10 mil per 3.8 liters, and then Indicarb, 10 mil per 3.8 liters, Cure at 5 mil per 3.8 liters, and Cabarin at 15 mil per 3.8 liters. And actually, if you follow this program, so each product one behind the other, you know, based on our findings, we find that you get pretty excellent control in terms of all your, you know, your lepidopters for doctor or your what we'll call what you call worms or larvae, you know, in any crop that you have, you get pretty good control once you follow this program with these five products. Now, nematodes is also a major issue that can affect soil. And, you know, if you have nematodes in your sweet peppers, hot peppers, etc., you know, it's, it's, you know, the kind of damage that nematodes can do. And what they do, they live in soils where they await suitable plants for infestation. So it's not every, every plant that they're going to infest. You know, they have their specialties, they focus on, say, the salinaceous crops, so your peppers, your tomatoes, etc. And what they do is that they create knots on the roots due to their activities, and it actually prevents the plants from developing and growing because they cannot take up nutrients from the soil. Eventually, it costs, causes the plants to die. And what we recommend to you is that you avoid planting on soils that may have had previous infestations of nematodes. We also recommend that you avoid using tools and equipment in infested areas, as this may help to spread the pest. A lot of times, we are our own worst enemies with nematode infestation and spreading, because even your water boots, you're walking into an infected field or infested field, and then going to another field that is not infested and bring the nematodes across. And once you plant the crops that are conducive to nematodes, then they start to reproduce. A product though that we have that we recommend that can help to improve your soil quality, stimulate root growth and development, and enhance crop growth and vigor is garland. And you know, using this especially in soils, you know, in soils that have nematodes, you find that you still get that excellent growth from your plants, even though nematodes may be present in the soil. Now, the next disease that we want to look at is Phytophthora, and it's also called soil wilt disease based on where you go. Now, it's a soil-borne fungus affecting soil roots leading to wilt and it's able to survive in the soil for years. How do you, and when I say years, I mean like two, three, four years after that affected crop is taken out, you can still find 
the disease in the side. Um, and easily it's identified by a girdle on the stem and this girdle is just above the soil line. And then what you'll see is wilting occurring in the plant and then the eventual death of the plant. Now, how we recommend that you can treat or prevent this disease is through crop rotation. So if you've identified that you're having a problem with this disease in your field, practice crop rotation. Don't plant back those same crops in the soil again there. Plant something else for even a year or two and give the soil a chance. You know, plow the land and give it a chance to, 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 to and give it a chance to 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 bring that particular disease, the level of the disease down. Good soil and water management is also key because the soil itself and the water, if it is that you have the water flowing and water logging conditions in the soil and it's not draining properly, then it also leads to the disease reproducing and getting more and more infectious. You're having much more chances of infection spreading throughout the field. Also, the use of systemic fungicides is another key thing that can be done in combination with some nutrient products, which I'll mention now. Topsin can be used as a foliar and drench, along with saita, which is a nutrient mix, but it also assists in fighting and treating phytophthora issues and giving it that extra boost in production. So a lot of times what we say to farmers, Combine topsin and saita or acrobat or zampra and saita as a treatment when you see phytophthora issues. Carbendazim also and sulfox in the early growth phase of the crop are also excellent products that can be used to reduce the risk of phytophthora in your crop. Now, leaf spot. This appears as a lesion or you see it like a little it's a circular looking lesion on your crops um on the leaves of your crops i should say and this spreads rapidly during humid and wet condition so you'll actually visit your field um and within two days after you start to see multiple plants multiple leaves especially at the top of the plants showing leaf spot issues and it's what, what t people typically say is that their leaves are burned now it spreads rapidly by a spore with days and and, and this is done pro providing that you have good conditions for um for the spread of the disease now leaf drop is common once the disease starts to spread and get more and more uh infected and it leads to the eventual death of the plant. Now, good aeration of the plot and proper drainage assists in reducing the risk. And when I say good aeration, I'm referring to your plant spacing, how you orient your, your, your beds based on the, the wind flow, because you know, once it is hot and humid, especially um, at the base of the plant, in the lower sections of the plant, you run a higher risk of these fungal diseases taking hold in your field. So if you, as best as possible, orient your plots so that the wind can blow through the rows, not into the side of the rows. Another treatment includes topsin at 15 grams per 3.8 liters, mancozeb at 30 grams per 3.8 liters, and acrobat at 15 grams per 3.8 does. Now powdery mildew and this is one that actually spreads pretty quickly and it affects a number of farmers and reduces their marketable yield you know because nobody wants any white looking soil your soil must be deep red or black looking so that you know so you're getting some good strong soil drink out of it. Now, it's a powdery white fungus on the leaves and fruits of the plant, and it spreads via spores through splash and wind activities. And I want you all to think of spores, think of it like some eggs, and what is eggs that 
one's you splash it and it goes onto another leaf, think that it cracks on when it touches the other leaf, and then it spreads the disease there, and then the disease produces more spores that spreads to other leaves, and it just continues. You will see this disease more though in the cooler, rainy periods and in places that don't have very good aeration and high humidity. And the plant's leaves and branches may become twisted and deformed, and it even results in leaf drop. However, the great thing about powder mildew is that it's easily treated using simple contact fungicide. And among those fungicides would be a mancozeb, which could be used at 30 grams per 3.8 liters, popsin at 15 grams per 3.8 liters, and trifmine at 15 grams per 3.8 liter. Now, in terms of yields, yields may vary based on varieties. However, with the traditional variety, a one to one and a half kilogram per plant over four to five weeks is achievable. And this is, and what, what I'd like to, to, to give you all as a disclaimer, because these yields can be much higher once they use our CCJ program to help boost your production. So this may be what I would say now is on the lower side in terms of in terms of um, production. The Manchester black, one to two kilograms per plant over four to five weeks. And the bashment, which is everybody's new favorite, two to three kilograms per plant over a six to eight week period. Okay, so let's look at some costs here because at the end of the day, this is what is very important to each of us as farmers. Now, land prep is one cost that you will encounter, you know, um, but um, in many cases and for soil itself, you know, it can be a crop that follows or precedes another crop that you might be planting. So you could have cabbage before sorrel or cabbage after sorrel, uh, peas before or after, or even, um, uh, and so it depends on how you want to use your land um, going forward um, before and after the sorrel crop. And typically um, the cost is about $50,000 to prepare uh, one hectare plot. Your labor, we're estimating about 20 man days at 2,000 per day, and that's 40,000 as a cost. The planting to plant the seedlings, about 4,000 seedlings, and this is if you are doing um, your transplanting, you're looking at about 48,000 there. Fertilizer, we look at about 16 bags, and this will be 16 of the uh, the big bags per per hectare, and you know this will be split into two applications because you know, one uh, one early in the crop life and one just about flowing, and this will run you about one hundred and seventy six thousand dollars. And then your harvest cost, you pay per kilogram to harvest. You know, soil is a bit tedious when it comes time to harvest because you have to pluck each individually unless you have a machine that can pluck the seeds for you, you're looking at about uh, 960,000 to harvest uh, to harvest and pluck. So that is where you would probably run your highest cost um, in the whole ter in terms of producing soil. The spray, and um, this will look at all our CCJ products as part of a spray program. It's about $186,000 over a three to four month period to spray your soil. So that is not bad for an investment over three to four months. And then, you know, you look at a contingency, suppose something happens, you know, 10% of your total cost is 146000 which will leave us with a total cost of production of about $1.6 million. However, once you have got the yield, which we know is possible for soil, 
you should be expecting a total yield per hectare of about 24,000 kilograms uh, with a total cost of about 1.6 million, as I mentioned before. Now, sale of soil is typically between 150 and 220 per kilogram. However, it does at times go up based on the season, based on conditions. You know, so our, you know, 68 to $100 per pound, you know, but we all know it does go high up to 150 and 200 per pound for soil. Now, when we look at the benefit from planting soil, we see where, you know, you earn, you have the potential to earn $5 million from soil, and you have a cost of about $1.6 million, which will leave you with about $1.9 million uh, to $3.6 million as your profit. So, you know, in terms of soil production, that is pretty good for you out there looking to grow. You know, anything that in four months can give you a million dollars in return so as profit is always an exceptional thing to look at and go. All right, so at this time, I'll be taking any questions that anyone would have out there. Uh, okay, so for Lisa, um, our, our, our sessions are actually recorded and they are on YouTube. So you can rewatch any of our live presentations on YouTube, no problem there. Uh, Miss Miller Simpson. Hello, good afternoon, Mr. Linky. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, very clear presentation, so thank you very much for that. I want to ask the question of, um, do you also provide any guidance in terms of markets? Because um, going through this material is very good, and it's assumed that the persons come on board and they go ahead and they invest um, do you have any contacts with particular markets that you can point us towards? Okay, so I can share with you a number of companies that I know farmers who they supply. So, uh, all by, you know, True Juice, um, Spike Industries, uh, mm -hmm. Grace Kennedy, those are companies that actually purchase soil year to year for use in their production. Mm -hmm. And Another important thing to note, and you know, in approaching these processes, especially juice manufacturers, you know, one of the reasons why some have not pivoted to producing soil juices right through the year is because of a lack of consistency in farmers planting and supplying them. So I can share this that up to two years ago, um, just before COVID, I should say. Uh, you know, True Juice was one of the companies that were actually looking for farmers to do soil year round for them, for them to put in juices. However, they weren't getting the, 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 the supply that they needed to run the factory for soil juice. And as such, they couldn't produce soil juice. So, you know, even for you guys as farmers out there, it's an important thing that you can, approach, you can as group with other farmers, you know, to get the acreages up and plan and approach these companies to actually have the juices made and um, you know, you'll be able to supply them to make the juices. Okay, thank um, you very much. Not a problem. All right, uh, Galaxy A10S um, asked how to tell the different varieties apart. Okay, so with the, the Bashment and the, and the traditional and the Manchester Black, the Bashment is actually the lightest red in coloration so that one tends to be a lot lighter and the plant is a lot smaller the leaves are, are smaller as well so you tend to to know that one pretty simple as you see it you know that that one is 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 the bashman and then you also have the white one which would also be um another three-month variety that is available the manchester black that one is deep deep black with very large calyx or the fruits, uh, whichever way you want to look at it, those tend to be much larger 
um, and deep, deep red, almost black or purple looking. And then the traditional, you don't have much of that being produced anymore. Um, it's probably been 10 years since I've seen someone with that the, the traditional variety, probably there is none, none left um, because most farmers did not find that variety to be the, to be the most profitable um, in terms of production. So you, I, I doubt you will actually see that one. The two that you'll most likely come across is the Manchester Black and the Bashman. So if you know what to look out for those two, then you shouldn't be in any, in any issues. Um, to tell the seeds apart, that one is, is beyond me. I'm not really able to tell the seeds apart because both sets of seeds look similar to each other. Uh, any other questions? Yes, um, quick one. Is there any thought to some kind of partnership between CCG and um, let's say a group of farmers? And is there any provision for management and um, assistance with, with in-field management? Okay, so um, let me answer the second part. Um, well, as for CCJ, we work closely with any one of our farmers who wants to do production and any, any crop that they want to produce. And we try our best to facilitate and make sure that you are able to meet your production goals and objectives as best as, as we can with your circumstances. And also if it is a group of farmers, we'll be even more than happy to come and work with you to ensure that we get your group producing to meet whatever market goals that you have. So in terms of that part, definitely we're there mm -hmm. for you. First part might be a little above my pay grade, so I might ask Georgia to chime in and give you an answer with that aspect. And good afternoon, Miss Malone. Good afternoon, afternoon Georgia. Yes, I'm going to ask you to send me your contact via the chat. We can sure. speak on here where this is concerned. Okay, will do. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in our upcoming events uh, on Wednesday, well, tomorrow, I will be on, sorry, I will be on <clears throat> along with, I believe it is Dane Parker tomorrow morning um, on Power 106 FM for a regular feature farming today with CCJ from 6.18 to 6.45 AM. And um, you can look out for me again on Friday, September 23rd at 3.30 PM for a live session on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. And this will be on Irish potato production. And it's, we're focusing on the Bamba Irish potato and the CCJ dip. And this will have myself and Sion Spence on. And we're currently also taking orders for Banba Irish Potatoes. You can contact your PDA, your Product Development Agronomist, your Technical Sales Agronomist, or the office at 757-0022-4. And also ensure, ensure that you know, if you need some technical support, you have some issues that you need worked out, you can actually make contact with us. Uh, we are willing to assist you and we are spread right across the island. You know, so just make contact, make contact with us if you need any help and guidance. Now, the last thing that I'll be touching on is our giveaway. And I believe today what we'll be giving away is a bottle of Evergreen. Now the question is, <clears throat> what is the product Garland? So I mentioned an Omex product, Omex Garland. What is Omex Garland good for? Um, Lucky. 
In the meantime, we have a question on YouTube. Um, are nematodes the same as earthworms? That's the question. Okay, so no, nematodes and earthworms are actually two different things. So the earthworms themselves uh, are actually soil organisms that, you know, they would be feeding on what will be like decaying <clears throat> plant material. You know, they live in the soil, they help to aerate the soil, provide all those good things that you need in the soil. However, on the other hand, now the nematodes, though you, you know, in the image on the slide, it kind of would look like a little earthworm there. It's actually not a, a worm per se. But what they do is that they actually infect the, the, the roots um, of the plant and cause those little nuts from their activities, you know, their feeding and, and, and how they live and reproduce in the soil, in the roots, and cause those nuts. And then eventually the plant won't be able to take up the nutrients from the soil that it needs, and eventually it dies. Okay, do we have um, an answer for the question on Onyx Garland? Shanice Weber said nematodes. All right, so Shanice, I, I, I think I'll give you a, a, a half correct fight there, um, but it's not, 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 not only that really that it is good for nematode but what it actually does you know is because of how it improves the soil condition the soil structure it also stimulates root growth and reduces the effect that nematodes would have on the plant you know basically nullifying what they, their activities so that you actually still get your production it's a pretty good try but remember it also helps to build your soil as well so don't leave out that part and lucky Yes. There is, well, Nicola Walker on YouTube said it's a nematicide used to eliminate nematodes. Well, we don't, we don't want to leave out the, 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 the fact that for garland, you're getting the soil quality improvement. All right, so just note that as, a, as, as another important thing. So Shanice Weber it was, please, direct message uh, Georgia with your contact and she will organize with you to collect your prize. And to all the farmers out there who joined us both on Zoom and YouTube, I want to say thank you for participating, for taking the time out. Please feel free to contact us with any issues that you may have. We're always here to serve you. And until the next time we speak, take care. And um, before you go, also, thank you. There's another this question. What's the price of the Irish, please? I'm going to ask Mr. Please. Peggy Flynn. Before the end of the week is out, you may call us. And hopefully by tomorrow, call us at the office at 876-757-0022. And we will give you the price for the band box. Thank you so much, Lekki, and thank you, everyone. We look forward to seeing you next week, Friday the 23rd, at our live session.